Welcome to Great Comedic Minds by Kara Robertson, a podcast where we meet some of the greatest comedic creators of our time and find out their real stories. From your favorite TV shows, movies, and live stand-up, we interview the storytellers and joke writers who have entertained us for years to find out exactly how and why they do it. And now, here's your host, Kara Robertson. I'm here with Chris Franklin and Jared Goundry. Chris is the headliner for our new show, Shellshocked, and Jared is the MC. Shellshocked is a show where the lineup is entirely military veterans for military veterans. And our first show is going to be at the Sit Down Comedy Club, November 16th, 8 p.m. Tickets at standup.com.au. So I just wanted to welcome you both. Thank you so much for joining us today. Cheers, Cara. Thanks for having us. So, Chris, you've been doing comedy for, is it 26 years now? Yeah, I put 27 on Facebook, but it's been that long. I just got the years wrong. And it was 26 years on the 12th of October. Yeah, wow. Congratulations. That's awesome. And in your career, uh, you had number one, Aria number one song, Bloke. You've won Raw, you've won a series of other competitions, you've been all over the world, you've done, is it four Tour de Forces? Um, yes, yes, it has been. Yeah, excellent. And Jared? Yes, I don't have a I don't have a long list of accolades as long as Chris's. I've been oh. in the game for seven years. Yeah, not yet. You will, though. I'm sure you will. Yeah, so- yeah. He's climbing that ladder pretty quickly. And to be <laughs> fair, when I won all those awards, there were only three comedians in Australia. It was a long time ago. <laughs> So Jared's had sold out shows, a string of sold out shows at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, very successful podcast uh, called Six Weeks from Broke, and is yeah. becoming an internet sensation very quickly. Yeah, internet sensation's a weird word, isn't it? That's, it is. Uh, like, it sounds kind of nice, but then my mum doesn't understand what that means. For me, no, it's a mile, a mile away from stand-up comedian. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> what does your mum think you do? Um, good question. I remember when I first, because I went from being in the military to then running a pretty successful restaurant to then saying, I don't want to do anything like that again. And I want to do comedy. And mum did say, are you sure you know what you're doing? And I had, and I said, no, I've got no idea. And, uh, she was very, she's been always been good to me. And, uh, she said, well, I support you. If you need a hand, let me know. Whenever you do a show, we'll be there. And uh, she still doesn't quite understand it, but she's supportive. Oh, that's nice. Um, reminds to be me of fair, that. Jared, I, I, I'm, as we mentioned, 26 years into comedy. My beautiful mother's 90 years old and 26 years in, she s- still says to me, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, you were in the Navy? That's correct, yeah, in the 80s. In the 80s. So you were a chef? Uh, we were just called cooks in the Navy, but cook, while yeah. I was serving... Uh, was about the time they started to recognise us as chefs. If you'd done four years in the Navy as a cook, which was the equivalent of a civilian apprenticeship, when you paid off out of the Navy, you paid off with your trade certificate as a chef. Oh, yeah, right. And uh, you cooked for the Queen. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that that was just um, luck of circumstance, not not really due to any skill I had as a cook. Um, I, I was working in the wardroom at HMAS Cerberus, which is where the officers eat, and uh, obviously that's where the queen was going to eat as well. She came down for the changing of the colours in 1988, it may have been. And um, I I happened to be working there. So all of us that were the the wardroom cooks were the ones that prepared the banquet for her. We actually almost killed her. How? (laughs) (laughs) But you have to cook the meal. We originally cooked it for the Premier of Victoria, who was John Kane, to approve. Then we cooked it for the Prime Minister, who was Bob Hawke, to approve. And then we cooked it for the Queen's representative, uh, the Governor-General, Sir Zelman Cohen, to approve. They all approved the menu, so we cooked it for the Queen. And 70% of the menu was seafood, and Elizabeth Windsor was allergic to seafood. Oh, okay. (laughs) That's unfortunate. Is the Queen allergic to garlic? Is that true? Uh, we weren't told that at all. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't remember if there was any garlic dishes in there. I, I just remember the whole seafood thing. And Jared, you're ex-army, so you were in infantry. Yeah, the mighty Second Battalion for seven years up in Townsville. So I look forward to. I get to go back to Townsville in two weeks' time to do a show up there. So they always uh, welcome me back pretty pretty nicely when I go up there. Okay, and you probably yeah you get all your your mates. Are they still there? 
Not many. Well, I, there's. I spoke to one of my friends recently, so I, I left the military at the grand uh, rank of lance corporal, and I talked to a couple of mates. One of my mates is getting posted back up there, and uh, we were chatting on on Facebook. And then I said, "What rank are you, by the way?" And he said, "Oh, I'm a I'm the RSM." Oh right. <laughs> and I was like, "Wow!" Because we we went through basic training together in 2006, so I guess 16 years will do that to. Someone, if they stay in long enough, everyone else falls around them. Stephen, yeah. Stephen Bradbury of the army, I reckon. Yeah, you just stick it out and you'll get somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, what was it like being in the Defence Force in the 80s? Uh, it was a different time. Um, women weren't allowed at sea back then. They are now. Um, I, I'm sure that would have cooked up quite a stink at, at the time they made the change, uh, the, the, just through superstitions. It was a sailor's superstition that it was bad luck to have women at sea. Okay. Uh, I always wonder who made that up. Yeah, yeah. Someone who who had been scorned by a woman, I believe. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> Just me and my mates. Yeah. It was a time where if you messed things up, the the leading seaman cook would drag you in the cool room and punch you in the face for it. Where you couldn't do that these days, you know. It's um, I, I caught up with a friend, like Jared said. Uh, I, I I was a lowly able seaman, and um, all the people I served with or started with. Uh, I went back and visited over the years, and um, one of them, Bungie Williams, ended up being the the chief petty officer cook in charge of the main galley at Cerberus. And he said, we hardly do anything these days. They've got civilian contractors in doing all the cooking. Oh, right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah just so definitely I can't changed. imagine what it's like these days. Yeah, no. Have you got any, like, really interesting stories or anything really funny that happened? Uh, there, there was a time uh, I was on HMAS Perth, and we were doing a, a run around the South Pacific with a, a ship, uh, HMAS Yarra uh, a friend of mine um, Poss Abel Seaman Green he slept whenever he could he was on the Yarra uh, I think we are in Honiara and there was a bomb scare on the Yarra and everyone was evacuated off and the whole ship was cleared and then everyone went back onto the ship and that's when Poss woke up out of his rack he had slept through the whole thing on the ship hadn't been cleared out at all could have blown up yeah so yeah, that, that was one of the things that we always laugh about. We had. Chris, um, did you did you ever cross the equator? No, I, I stayed around the South Pacific. You, you're um, asking about the ceremony crossing the equator. I only just heard about the crossing of the line uh, ceremony from another navy navy dig um, recently, and I was blown away. Have you heard about this car? Yeah, I've got a friend who he's shown me photos. Weird. They're like putting baked beans over him. He's dressed as Neptune. The, you know, there's all this weird stuff happening. Yeah, the, the most the most senior person on the ship involved in the ceremony is always King Neptune in that ceremony. And those that hadn't crossed the line before are always initiated in some weird way. <laughs> I remember, or oh, early in my comedy career, that there, there was a, a national stink when one of the People that had been initiated uh, complained to OH&S. Uh, OH&S. It was about the time that people were allowed to stand up for themselves, and um, <laughs> he made it very pl- public that they'd put a funnel in his rectum and um, poured sump oil in there. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I got asked to do a radio interview about the thing, being a comedian and being ex-navy, and the the DJ asked me, um, do, do, "Do I think they've gone too far?" And I said it was actually scientific. The reason they were doing that was uh, because when you're south of the equator, the sump oil swirls in a certain way. And when you're north, oh. <laughs> that was just so they could tell exactly when they were crossing the equator, basically. <laughs> the Coriolis <laughs> effect. Yeah, that's <laughs> the standard check. <laughs> and Jared, you went to uh, East Timor? Yeah, 2000 and, um, 2007 with uh, Opastute, part of the sort of the second United Nations intervention over there. It was uh, it was awesome. It was a great, great trip. I think I told my girlfriend at the time I was going for three months, but we ended up coming home about eight months later. And uh, it was a, it was wicked. I mean, I was nineteen. A tourist attraction one day. If they fixed the airport, if they if they fixed the holes <laughs> in the runway, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. It was it was absolutely awesome. I, I've been on a few navy ships myself um franklin and it's uh it's the bedding it's the sleeping arrangements that always used to get me it's the... well, well they're not cruise liners jared they're they're <laughs> three bunks high and they fold up against the wall so because they're basically they drop down into the hallways so and it smells like farts 
Yeah. The whole place stinks. There's 300 people in a sardine can. I imagine if you get um, gastro or pink eye, that must just run through the whole ship. Oh, yeah. There there was um, an outbreak of lice on the Perth when I was there. They they just took everyone's clothes and just disinfected them in the laundry. <laughs> we 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 in we in uh in the army you have to do a um you, if you're in charge if you're a lance corporal you need to check everyone's feet and check check everyone's crutch when you're out bush and uh, there's a gentleman's agreement that you just if you've got something wrong you just let you just let <laughs> let someone know you know you don't want to do that job every single day and uh, we were out on jungle training we're about twenty three days in Tully, uh, without a shower, full, full tactical, um, exercise. And we had this new young bloke in our battalion, in our platoon, and he was in my section and I saw him, he was marching a bit like John Wayne. He had, he had the gate open and I could see something was wrong with him. And I went up to him and I said, mate, what's, what's going on downstairs? And he said, he just said, it's bad. And I said, all right, let's, let's get four, four meters into the jungle and let's have a look. So pulled his pants down and a layer of skin had come with his crutch and now he chafed on his chafed in his crutch and then that had blistered then that had got infected and then it just the, it just stunk so me and my section commander thought we'd uh we'd play a little bit of a trick on him so we went off into the bush with on the radio then we came back and we said look mate we've just been on the on the radio to the medics we're going to have to do a field amputation of your cock <laughs> and he was no 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 i'm fine and we said look don't worry about it dva is going to give you a prosthetic one they're really good <laughs> these days they're made of carbon fiber in fact it's probably going to be better than your original one no 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 i'm fine <laughs> and, and then uh, uh, we ended up mar- marching him out to the nearest road he got there and we saw him a week later he was just on the balcony of the rap waving his fist at you you fucking bastards <laughs> that's the story of how we got the first female into the army <laughs> that's it, that's it. they're like they're like i was in i was uh in the infantry the day that we found out that females were being let in because it'd been a rumor for about six months and all of the boy infantry male only and uh they sat us down in this auditorium to break the news and then the local member of parliament came out and sort of said, right, men, you might have heard on the telly that we might, we got some women are going to be around here. And one guy just stood up and went, no, and then left. <laughs> <laughs> He's just too traumatised to deal with it. <laughs> you can't just leave the army. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some people have tried. I quit. <laughs> um, if you could go back to you, to yourself on recruitment day, I'll start with you, Chris. Yeah. Would you, what would you say to yourself? Would you still have gone into the Navy? I believe so. I, 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 I was um, military family. My father did 22 years in the Navy. He was also a cook in the Navy. So okay. I, I was, from a very young age, I was always going to follow dad's footsteps. And, and that's what I did. And I, I only served eight and a half years in, in the service, but that was the perfect time for me. It was uh, long enough to learn respect and discipline, but not that 20 year period where you become institutionalized in and all you know is the military, you know? So yeah, uh, I, I would recommend anyone do a, a 10 year period in any of the defense defense forces. So it, it, it does teach you respect and discipline and how to interact with people. So uh, that's what I got out of it the most. Yeah. Right. Uh, what about you, Jared? I wouldn't change a thing either. I went in at 18, left at 25, um, learned how to make a bed, do some serious life skills. Uh, it was incredible. And the that growth period in between sort of 18 to being a sort of middle mid twenties is so different. You kind of come out same thing as Chris. Like I'm, I'm glad I didn't do 20, 25 years. I still got out and I was like, wow, I've got my own, got my own sort of life, my whole life ahead of me. Do you know what I mean? But I loved it. I'm going around and doing comedy now. One of the main things that I do is I sleep in people's spare rooms. And no matter where I go in Australia, someone I used to serve with is always the quickest to just send me a message and say, mate, I seen you coming here. Where are you staying? And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about getting a hotel. Nah, we'll come pick you up from the airport. 
that's come, lovely. come stay with the missus and the family, you know? Yeah. So that was, that's an, in, what an incredible camaraderie and it transcends years. What I like about people who I served with is I could not have sp- spoken to them in a decade. And as soon as you bump back into them, it's just, it's like, it never, it never finished. It's interesting. You bring that up, Jared, but uh... 1980 I joined I was 16 just turned 16 years of age and um now with the with with Facebook and all that sort of thing I joined up with 73 other well there were 73 of us in total that didn't know each other from bar of soap as 15 16 year old kids uh now all these years later we're all turning 60 this year and um we've got a Facebook group for our intake two two of the guys have passed away but there's 71 of us on that and we still interact Whenever I'm somewhere doing a show in that area, catch up with one of these guys I've known for 40 odd years, 43 years. Unreal. That is, mm. let's give him a chills. It's good. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the transition to comedy. So, obviously, Jared, you were a chef in the middle. I will say the fact that there's two chefs, Chef Cook, on uh, the lineup was not an accident either, just in case we go on tour. I like <laughs> having that there. But um, how did you find moving into comedy, especially because the Defence Force, you can be a very, you know, uh, straight sort of person and comedy requires you to be a bit out there, a bit out of your brain, a bit, you know, thinking differently. I, uh, so I left, I left, the, I left the military in 2012 after seven years. In my spare time, I used to cook. That was my thing I was pretty passionate about on the weekends I had all the guys around even when I got promoted and I wasn't supposed to have all the diggers around I still (laughs) would have all the diggers around my house cooking that was that was kind of my outlet so when it came time for me to leave the military I thought what am I going to do I don't have any skills you know I'm infantry I I know where north is and I can call in a fire mission it's not it's not that helpful in the outside world and so I was like wow I'll do this thing that I love that's that seems like what you should do in life and then being a chef, I found was very similar to being in the army. I mean, you work in a team, you wear a uniform, you do what you're told. Everyone's got tattoos. Um, Shit hours. Everyone, everyone smokes. It's less <laughs> knives. It's just, it's the same thing. Right. And so I went into the, into a kitchen and it just, I excelled and uh, found myself working in fine dining, moved to Melbourne to do that. And then, uh, on a Tuesday night, there used to be this open mic in Melbourne. It's not there anymore, but it was like you sign your name down and you can just get up. And my hospitality w- weekend started on a Tuesday and we used to finish in the afternoon. So me and the guys used to go down to this open mic comedy night just to watch the bombs. Like we, it was <laughs> for us, we were just that's someone would do good and we were upset, you know, we're like, we're not here for this and uh, drink beers. It was kind of our Friday night. And, um, I watched that for three or four months and then it just started to creep in. I'd never thought about comedy as a career or any, I didn't even know it was possible. And I just started watching it. I was like, what is this activity that these people are doing to essentially no one? Like there was 12 people in this pub that held like 80 and there was this 30 comedians just waiting to have their five minutes that they wrote their name down. And I, I just thought it was the most unreal, weird experience ever. And then I don't know what happened, but I just wrote my name down once and just bombed hard. <laughs> and then <laughs> I was talking to the comedians it. after the after the show and they were talking about yeah. the jokes that worked. And I was like, jokes, I better get some of them. And just went back the next week and bombed. And then I went back the third week and I was like, if this doesn't work, then whatever. That was a bit of fun. And then it just happened to go all right. So I just never stopped. Oh, excellent. Very good. What about you, Chris? Yeah, I um, I, I was um, pretty well homeless in Melbourne, and um, uh, I I was in a bar, uh, Edwards Tavern in Richmond, and there was a guy at the bar who'd been on Hey Hey on Saturday the Saturday before doing stand up. Chris Bennett, his name was, and uh, so I went over and started annoying him for a while. Here's a joke you can use, and here's another one you can use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He said, if you like your comedy that much, I'm hosting a show at the Espy in St Kilda this Sunday. Come down, I'll put your name on the door. You can watch a show for free. So I went down there. My name was on the door. I went backstage to thank him, and uh, he threw me on stage as the MC. It was the open mic thing at the Espy. I I was completely unprepared, and he was just standing in the wings yelling out, here's one you can use, and (laughs) got me back completely. 
Oh, How'd you go? Uh, my maiden five minutes, I think I did 17 minutes of old Cole Elliott jokes. Yeah. And um, <laughs> got a laugh from the audience and enjoyed the experience. Uh, walked off thinking I was the king of comedy. Yeah. And um, the promoter, Trevor Hall, came up to me. I said, how good was that? He said, yeah, next time write your own jokes. I went, oh, shit, you've got to write them as well. But I got the bug <laughs> from being up there. Yeah, that was it. Oh, very good. What's your uh, career highlight? Um, singing bloke in the middle of the MCG to 30,000 people was pretty cool. Oh, wow. What did that feel like? Um, yeah, it wasn't bad. I, I almost got into a fight with a 12-year-old kid on the fence, though. Okay. What um, happened there? <laughs> one of the kids said, um, I bought your CD. And I said, oh, thank you. And the kid next to him said, I, I just burned his. Oh. <laughs> I, I thought, I'm 5,000 short of double platinum. You're the reason, mate. And I got a bit angry with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, other highlights would definitely be the um, the uh, Defence Force tours. Uh, we said four earlier. I worked out it was five. I did Solomon's East Timor twice in Afghanistan and once in Iraq. Oh, apologies for that. So um, I, I thought it was four too. I was just yeah. thinking about it. But... This is what happens when I use Wikipedia. To find <laughs> Isn't it amazing that you've uh, been to more places with the Defence Force as a comedian than when you served? I, ironically, I, I, I was kicked out of the Defence Force for not having a spleen. Um, they said I couldn't go to malarious areas. Uh, yeah, right. I was unable to travel with the Navy because I didn't have a spleen. And now without a spleen, the Defence Force has taken me all over the place. <laughs> and, nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good argument to be having with DBA, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, not to mention if you were you grew up a little bit in Papua New Guinea, that's like Malaria Central, right? Yeah, I, I had a spleen then, though. Oh, you had a spleen, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, right. Um, so what do you remember anything about Papua New Guinea? O only through family slides. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Dad was in the Navy, and New Guinea was a territory of Australia back then. And okay. um, he served two years on Manus Island at a naval base called HMAS Tarangau. So I lived there. I had a pet couscous. I remember that, which is their word for possum. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, late nights sort of sleeping on couches in the senior sailors' mess while they had parties going on and bands playing. And I remember the band was called the Tarangau Titbits. Uh, they used to play there. Mum and Dad were party animals, so they were there all the time, and I'd just have to sleep in the back of the, back of the senior sailors' mess. I remember that. What else can I tell you about that? Oh, Manus Island, where the base was, was what later became that refugee base. So I lived for two years in that refugee camp. Um, where'd you grow up, Joe? Perth, WA. Oh, that's right. So what was that like? That's, well, that's why I joined the army, because all yeah. my friends were becoming electricians and plumbers, and I didn't have any interest in doing that. So I didn't I didn't even... My grand great-grandfather is on that famous picture of all the troops on the pyramid. Wow. Oh, right. Uh, Frank Goundry, that's the 11th Battalion. My uncle wrote a book about that battalion called Legs 11. Um, then his son served in World War II. Wow, was, he was like bomber crew, essentially, uh, the, like ground crew in the Pacific. And uh, then it just skipped a whole bunch of generations. And I was, it comes to me, I'm the, the next serving person in the family. But I, I was just, I didn't want to be in a tradie. And that's what everybody did in WA. So... I joined the army pretty much by mistake. I went to the city of Perth to meet my mum for lunch. I was 18. She sent me a text message. She said, I'm going to have to, can you kill an hour? I'm going to be an hour late. I was standing outside the recruitment center and I looked up and I went, right. And then I walked in, picked up a pamphlet. Some guy came over with the big shoulders and a nice chin and he said, do you, do you want to watch a movie about this? And I said, yeah, I, had a, I, had a, I had a mullet. I had a, I had a blonde mullet in 2006. And, Bring it back. Uh, yeah. And uh, then watched the movie. And he said, if he said to me, he closed the door behind him because he wasn't allowed to say this. But he said to me, he goes, mate, do you know how many girls you'd get if you're in the army? And I just went back to lunch to see mom. And I was like, I'm joining the army. And, uh, yeah, about six weeks later, I was in a shower with 87 other naked men, and I thought, that guy got me. <laughs> Did it work? Did you get any girls from saying you're in the army? No, nah, well, I went to Townsville, and then they, they hate AJs up there. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm still waiting. Does anyone have anything like, what was your hardest thing that you did in the Defence Force? 
Ooh, you go first, Jared. Well, I think we uh, sleep deprivation training. Oh wow, it doesn't get it easier. So 70, 72 hours, I think, um, getting kept up at night, and you start to hallucinate. Yeah, which is pretty funny. And um, me and a friend of mine, we were both walking out to our sentry spot, and then we said, "Oh, stop!" And then we looked down, and our shadows kept walking, and then they stopped. And we both went, "Oh, I think yeah. we've we need some sleep." Um, and then they let then they let you sleep afterwards, and I, I slept for twenty one hours, and I peed my pants. Oh wow, because you were that tired. <laughs> yeah, because I You're didn't wake up. Out. I didn't wake up to go to the toilet. Yeah, right. Uh, so that was yeah, that was probably one of the more hard things to do. Yeah, where was that? That was at Singleton. Was that and... part of infantry training? Yeah, I think it's in Singleton. Yeah, that is part of the. I don't know why we never used it ever again, but it's good to have that benchmark. Yeah, definitely. In life to be like, oh, I've been awake this long before I can do it. Yeah, you know, you can do it if you've got something you got to prepare for. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when, when you hallucinate, that's when you're going too far. Definitely. Yeah. 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 What about you, Chris? Have you thought of anything? Longest I've stayed awake or, or the worst thing? In the... <laughs> you would have done longer than that on a bender, wouldn't you? Uh, longest I was going to say, longest I've stayed awake is five days, but it wasn't with the military. It was on a North Melbourne Football Club Mad Monday. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Mad Monday, Tuesday. We finished when... on Mad Friday. Yeah, Mad Friday. <laughs> I, I actually hold the record at North Melbourne without even playing a game there for the um, longest time continuous drinking on a Mad Monday. Jesus. All, the, all the others came and went, and I stayed there the whole time. How many beers uh, did you have? Oh, I wasn't counting. If you had to put a number <laughs> on? Uh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> hard, hardest things I probably did uh, during um, recruit training was the um, NBCD stuff. Did you have that nuclear biological chemical defense? Yeah, absolutely. The, the gas mask and all that. They, they taught us all about the gas mask and showed us how to fit it and all that. Once we had it on, they put us in this brick box and then let off some tear gas. And then one by one, the, the chief petty officer in charge, who still had a, a mask on, would rip off your your mask and hold you there and say, what was your childhood phone number? And make you say something so that you had to breathe it in. And then you just go out with snot coming out your nose and oh. tears coming out your eyes and uh, feeling horrible and washing yourself down with water. And yeah, that, that was horrendous. I remember one guy, he ripped the mask off and said, what was your phone number? And the guy started crying and said, we didn't have a phone. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to sit there. <laughs> That's great. Make something when, up, you idiot. <laughs> when we did our gas training, we do that at our unit in um in Townsville, and that's you don't have to stay in the lines anymore. You get your own little accommodation. And I'd uh, had the gas training that day. Same thing. It's terrible, but the gas crystals they stay in your hair, and they kind of um you're supposed to go home and wash off, which I I didn't really listen to. But I'd gone run home straight to base because. Um, I had this girl staying there, which I wasn't supposed to have on base. And, um, you know, 19 years of age, pretty into it. And uh, got straight home. I said, come on, baby, let's have a shower. And uh, we're in the shower and we were making love. And then the steam from the shower reactivated the gas crystals. Oh, wow. And we just, just, I just tear gassed the both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Both started didn't... crying while you were making love. She didn't that stick around long beautiful. after that. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a story in Papua New Guinea when I was a little kid. Um, my dad came home from work and I was playing in the yard with tear gas canisters because the uh, they're called the Rascals. Have you heard of them? Mm, yeah, the Rebel Group. Yeah, they'd been doing something with the Lay Brothers and had just thrown the tear gas away, and I'd picked it up and was playing with it. But luckily, I didn't set anything off. I was only about three or four. And why why were you in New Guinea, Tara? Look, that's a confusing uh, question. I just, I don't know what's wrong with my parents. They were in Africa before. Um, they are Australian. They went um, over to Africa for about 10 years and then they, mum was pregnant. And so they thought maybe Papua New Guinea would be safer than Africa. Right. Yeah. Um, I think dad got a job. He's an electrician. He worked at Rothman's, the cigarette factory. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mm -hmm. think it was pretty good money for an electrician in those days. So did that and then came yeah. back and where property was cheap and, what property? Nice work. Yeah, very good. Yeah, all right. I've uh, run out of questions there. Did anyone want to add anything? 
show's super exciting donating some money to to legacy which do which do amazing things have you had much to do with legacy chris well, as I said, Dad was in, and he died of leukemia in '87. So from '87, Mum's 90 now. Um, legacy have looked after my mother, so I'm a big advocate for, for those guys. And um, yeah, uh, get to the show and support a cause that supports good people. Yep, definitely. That's uh, definitely, and we'll hopefully we'll be continuing with that cause, and hopefully a few other causes, and anything we can do to support veterans uh, and to support mental health in the defence force. So Shell Shock, the, our premiere event is Sit Down Comedy Club, November 16, 8 p.m., and you can get tickets at standup.com.au where you'll see Chris is our headliner, Jared MC, myself, and we've got Jack Knight and Michael Albrecht as well on the lineup. Huge lineup. Yeah, it's going to be great. Really excited. It's going to be a great show. So, uh, see you along. all there. Yeah, thank awesome. you very much. Thank you for joining us on a great episode of Great Comedic Minds. We'll be back next week, so be sure to tune in. Also, like, share, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to follow Carl Robertson on Instagram.